Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about is something a little bit different than the overall market. We're going to focus in on a particular aspect of engineering software, specifically analysis, simulation, and systems engineering. The stuff that figures out the performance. The stuff that make, determines whether or not things will work or not. So we formed the Assess Initiative to bring together key players to guide and influence the strategies for software tools for these particular applications. We did this for a reason, because we felt there was an opportunity and a demand where we could significantly expand the use and benefit of simulation related activities and systems engineering related activities, not by the typical growth, but to actually introduce an inflection point into the growth because of the current economic environment. So we felt there was an opportunity to do it. However, we can't get there just by doing the same thing we've been doing before. So we decided to create the Assess Initiative to bring together all the industry thought leaders to say, what can we change and how do we change it to move forward, to actually take advantage of this. It all started with a summit in 2015 that Brad Holtz and I put on. And then we followed that up and we created the Assess Initiative LLC as a legal entity in mid-2016. And then we formed the Assess Initiative membership program that went live in early 2018. So what are the key drivers behind the Assess Initiative? There's a growing demand on how to be more competitive across every industry, across every market. 2008, 2009 changed the rules. Everybody has to try to figure out how to be more competitive. It was there before in some industry leaders, but now everybody has to do it. At the same time, the complexity of products and processes is exploding exponentially. The available computing power is rapidly growing so that it's no longer the bottleneck. Your computing is not the bottleneck anymore. We always want more compute power, but it's not the limiting factor anymore. We also have a new world of 3D printed objects and light weighting, which I know Andreas is going to talk to everybody about. And we have entirely new applications that are creating a demand for simulation to enable breakthroughs. One of the ones leading this is biomedical. Biomedical is really trying to get out of the, let's put it in the patient and see what happens, or let's put it in the test bed and see what happens. We want to actually be able to understand the physics that's going on so we can actually design things we know they're going to work and understand a lot better. Including, we had the, uh, Tina Morrison from the US FDA actually give a keynote presentation at the last uh, Assess Congress, actually it was Assess Congress two years ago, and she uh, presented how they're actually accepting simulation as a method of certification. But one of the other negative challenges is that simulation is used by an exclusive club of limited experts who are very, very talented, who've spent multiple years learning how to use this stuff to make, get good results. That's the limiting factor. We can't grow these experts fast enough. Simulation efforts are also have an issue that there's three completely disjoint vectors. Industrial or commercial vector, government vector, and academic or research. They are not aligned. They are not talking to each other. They don't know that each other exists. And they're all busy working on hard problems and doing good work and repeating the same work that the others are doing. It's not scalable. We have to get back to getting these people talking to each other. Okay, so the Assess Initiative interacts and collaborates with multiple activities and organizations, including Cam Bashi, who we work with Peter and his team quite a bit on, see, on understanding the CAE market. We work with uh, COFES Institute, we work with Intrinsim, NAFEMS, and COSI, Revolution and Simulation, and several others, because we're trying to bring, act as a collaboration environment to bring together everybody who possibly could consider this to actually make a big difference. The program, as I said, the membership program was, a, was set up um, in the beginning of this year. It's to enable funding of the Assess Initiative deliverables and activities beyond the annual Congress, research papers, workshops, activities, anything that will help progress the Assess vision. People get access to the deliverable documents. They get the research papers, survey research, all of the theme and update reports, all the previous Congress presentations, and they can participate in helping the direction of Assess and a discount to the Assess Congress. So far we have 71 members since we started in January. This isn't bad. And we have uh, 10 sponsors who signed up. 
to actually just sponsor the overall initiative activity. So we've been getting a very good response to this. We're hoping it continues to grow, but we're seeing very strong interest. We've got several assessed members in the audience. So now I'm going to step back a little bit now that you've learned a little about the assess initiative and understand what the assess initiative talks about a lot called the simulation revolution. And this is all about the fact that the cha changing role of simulation, and we'll use the term simulation for all forms of simulation in, related to engineering, is really about becoming a major strategic piece of improving competitiveness. So it's about increasing innovation, increasing quality, reducing risk, reducing time, and reducing cost. And someone can ask, why is simulation important to this? If you step back and you realize that most everybody in manufacturing has already gone lean, there's only another 1% maybe to squeeze out of lean manufacturing. Possibly we can squeeze some more out of smart manufacturing. That's a new thing. But let's take that out of the equation and say, where else can we gain? It's all about understanding better how the product performs in order to make better decisions in the product design process, the product management process, the product support process, and even the product manufacturing process. How do you do understand performance better? You don't test to understand. You test to validate. You simulate to understand. So simulation is the key to achieving these objectives. The interesting thing is, and what's changing, is that the executives in the boardrooms are hearing this message and seeing people successfully like Procter & Gamble and others, other than the standard automotive and aerospace industries, they're seeing Procter & Gamble and others leverage simulation to lead to success in products on things like razor blades, things like diapers. So all of a sudden, it's, it's changing the game. OK, the other thing is it's all tempered currently due to the lack of expertise. This is an interesting chart. The uh, blue chart is actually sh an indicator of available expertise. The purplish chart, the middle one, is actually showing the current growth rates. And the magenta one is actually showing the potential demand increase. There are no time scales on it. There's no reference of numbers. This is a trend. This is a concept to convey so that we won't get into that discussion. But part of the problem, as we mentioned before, is the simulation is still done by specialized analysts. So the business drivers are going to force a simulation that we refer to as the engineering simulation and will be forced to find a way because they're going to put money behind it. They're going to bring it to the forefront. And simulation will not be the bastard stepchild anymore. It will be the prodigal son but who they want to replicate and clone as fast as possible. That transition's happening. And so where there's going to be a simulation revolution, and there's terms already going on, model-based, fit for purpose, integrated, smart, transparent or invisible, generative. There's, there's all these terms going on in the simulation community. And just for a little calibration, Bob Tickle gave a presentation in 2017 about their spend on simulation at Cummins Engine. And indeed, it maps the chart that I showed about demand. When they're being one of these leading companies, However, I did indicate to Bob that I think he's got these brakes on a little too fast. It's going to continue to grow a little bit more in these decades. He's breaking it too fast, in my opinion, and I told him that. But the general pattern is correct. Big explosion in the 2010s to 2020s. OK. Now let's take a look at some market data to back this up and see what's going on. We use Kambashi for the market data. And we looked at the, the, the CE observatories from Kambashi show us the 2D and 3D simulation market growth. And this is looking at 2017 numbers, which showed that it was the market's expected to grow to $7 billion by 2020. And the growth rate's about 8.5%. OK, and it's pretty flat, the growth rate. But if we look at the 2018 observatories, which we have a pre-look on, they have, they're just releasing them now. We can see that that growth rate is actually increasing, um, and it's increasing to about 1% more than was projected before, but still less than 10%. So we're seeing an uptick in demand. Whether or not assessors helped that or not, I can't qualify. We tend to think maybe we did. We, tend, we hope we did. But we think there's room for a lot more. So that, yeah, we're running 9.5% sort of growth rates, which is a pretty good growth rate, but that's not the potential. We're still double digits below what the potential is at least. So we still have an uncapitalized market here. So looking at the assess activities and how we organize things, we set up an assess advisory committee 
which has 58 industry thought leaders, 10 working groups set on defining the future directions, activities, and deliverables of the ASSESS initiative. Six of those are aligned with ASSESS initiative themes. So we'll talk about the themes. So we've organized activities around uh, these key themes. One is alignment of government research and commercial activities, which we've said is already an issue. The other is engineering simulation business challenges. If you ever want to have a fun conversation, put a CFO and a CFD analyst in the room together. They'll talk to each other for hours and neither one will understand a word the other one said. And they'll both walk away and turn to their friend and say, I don't know if he's brilliant or stupid. <laughs> it's the truth. It, and it's not even like Greek to Latin. It's like Earth to Pluto. It's, it's so foreign that translations don't work. This is an issue we need to work on is the communication. The other is engineering simulation credibility. There's a lot that's done in the engineering simulation community to make sure that things are credible and are good, but as we try to democratize it, if we, as we try to reduce the expertise that's required, it's not about the analyst making sure the work's right, the software has to make sure the work's right. The game is changing. Democratization of engineering simulation, what's that take, what's it required, what are the issues? Generative design, we have lots of interesting discussions on that, and integration of systems and detailed subsystems. And we're also looking at adding engineering simulation in the digital twins. So I'll give you a little bit of an update on these different themes. So the assess align theme says really that we need, when we talk about alignment, we really are talking about misalignment, and we can calibrate misalignment where we can't calibrate alignment, and perfect alignment would be zero misalignment. So that the, the source is that it's driven by different incentives. I'm not going to go through in detail, but the government sector, the private sector, and the academic sector are all driven by totally different incentives that don't align. There's also a time misalignment between commercial and government. There's different accounting practices. There's different audit requirements. There's different, um, and, and the government programs tend to start from scratch. They don't check what's done commercially. That's just true. And the IP expectations are totally different. There's only one common thing with the IP expectations. Whenever there's a collaboration, all of them want to own the IP, period. You can guarantee that everybody thinks they should own the IP no matter who creates it. And that just doesn't work in a collaboration. Okay. So we're actually working on a positioning paper which actually describes the current state of the art. And I'll call it a positioning paper overview of the theme, where we're going to research, where we're going to go. That should be actually be published um, by early to mid-2018. We're actually working, we, we have the draft, we're getting ready to publish it. On the business theme, we work together with Chris Wilkes, who's here, on a survey of business values. And it's interesting to see some primary benefits achieved by simulation. Reducing risk of failure, improving performance, improving quality, fast, reducing time, reducing cost. These are all the same five. These, these are considered the benefits of simulation. They are the, the strategic goals of any company. Similarly along that, looking at prototyping, physical prototyping as a cost, a, as an item, about 24% of the people said that sim, use of simulation was decreasing their need for physical prototyping. 26% it was increasing, which is interesting, and 50% not changing. And of those who said they were decreasing, 75% said it was because of broader use of simulation. So it's actually playing a role there. Our next step in the business theme is a research paper targeted in late 2018 to early 2019, which is about understanding and explaining the engineering simu simulation value proposition. We want to give the engineering managers the tools to talk to the CFOs. Credibility, we're looking at Currently, accountability is based on judgment, experience, and evidence-based verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification. We need to take into account simulation risk. We need to understand the appropriateness of every simulation model. And that brings into account engineering simulation governance, which has a long list of um, attributes to it. And if you really want to talk about simulation governance, Keith Menches, sitting in the audience, is the guy to talk to about this. 
And we're also looking at a research paper targeted for mid-2019, which is the guidelines for implementing an engineering simulation credibility framework, or another term was how to measure risk of your simulations. Because when you're using it to leverage decisions, you better understand what the risk of those decisions are in order to do this. And it's, gonna, it's based on the NASA standard on modeling and simulation, which very few people know about. I was actually surprised to learn about it at our last Assess Congress. It's an excellent document. What we're going to be doing is taking that document and adapting it for generalized use for engineering simulation so it's not NASA specific, it's not mission focused, and it's going to actually make some conclusions where it dropped. If you've read the document, Nathaniel, you understand exactly what I'm saying. Red, let, leads right up to the conclusions and says we're not in a position to make those conclusions. Okay, democratization theme. The de definition of democratization is a significant expansion of the use of engineering simulation by all users in a reliable way for whom access and power of engineering simulation would be beneficial. You'd ask, why do I explain the definition on this one? Because of the fact that the particular people working on this theme, we spent six months trying to come up with this definition because everybody had a specific way of what they looked at democratization. And what we learned is democratization is actually a big problem. There's not one size fits all. It's actually a very complex thing, including culture, including multiple different things. And so we have to address all the variants. So where are we today? Today, we're at the tip of the iceberg on users, but we're getting significant spend on those users. The current model is a few very knowledgeable people pay a lot of money to use software. As we go to more design, more people, that model will not work, which, which translates to the business challenges. So we also will be discussing what are the barriers to democratization and how do we overcome those. And our next working paper is actually understanding, we're going to be working on our uh, paper for late 2018, which is actually defining the different forms and implementation of democratization of engineering simulation and the related benefits. And it's all different levels of democratization, different types of organization, whether it's, whether it's democratization driven by a software vendor for an industry or whether it's driven by an end user company, the issues are different. There's some that are common, but there's a lot that are different. The generative theme, well, generative design, we also have a definition for this one. This is because it's new, is the use of algorithmic methods to quickly and automatically or iteratively transform requirements, constraints, uncertainties, and design space to create slash drive viable designs or outcomes. And everyone's saying, saying, huh? What it means is the total design paradigm's changing. Instead of saying, here's my 3D CAD model, does it work? Instead say, here's the space I can put it in, here's the function it's supposed to perform, and oh, by the way, give me the lowest cost model and out comes a thousand different design options. So I borrowed some words from Ted. I don't know, Ted, if you're here, but he put together these words. I'm not going to read them all, but I'll go to the top. It's actually a fundamental disruptive paradigm inversion. It's going to change the way we do design, period. Because we're going to derive the design from the performance that we want, not from the, from the skills of putting in a fillet or, or adding different features. Okay. There's lots of issues here, though. This technology is young. This technology is just growing, tremendously promising. If someone were to say, what about, a, uh, can I buy software that will do that today? I'll say, no. Can I buy software that would be promising and do some interesting things, that will do topology optimization, that will drive a 3D printer? Yes, but it's it got gaps. It works for this problem, but not that problem. And, and, it, and it works for components, but not assemblies. And actually, again, Andreas would be the one. He's got all this laid out. He'll tell you exactly where the issues are. Also, this is primarily still in research mode. There's a few people doing some commercial things, but it's primarily in research mode. And commercialization is a big issue. It, it, it's, it's struggling. It's also struggling because the CAD companies kind of want it, but don't want it. And they, they, they're kind of they a dance with it, trying to figure out what to do. So we also need to get people to understand the, the potential power of this whole new approach. And the integration theme uh, is all about integrating detailed systems and subsystems analysis with overall systems modeling engineering. 
Optimizing a component or a subassembly does not optimize the system. How do we know if we've met the system requirements if we don't involve actually the performance in terms of the whole system itself? So, and as systems get, more, and products get more complicated, we have to create systems models and do system simulations, and we have to drive them to also talk to the detailed models. Because the problem with 3D geometry is it doesn't work like abstractions. There's some small little detail that actually is the driving factor. So if you wait it to the end, you end up boxing yourself into a corner. So we'll talk about why is it hard, and we're working on a research paper there for understanding why integration <laughs> is so hard and, why, and what we have to do to move forward. The other activity we're involved with is the Assess Congresses. So the first Congress was the Assess Summit that we put on with 40 industry leading ambassadors. We brought 40, Brad and I brought 40 people into a room and said, okay, what's it take to make a change here? Um, we had some very interesting discussions. Uh, it was a very open just discussion forum and we had five working groups, very, and eight key issues came out. That led to the Assess 2016 Congress where we had 85 industry leading participants, four keynote presentations, 26 technology briefings, and seven working groups, each with a particular assess related theme. And those who were there, that's Snowmageddon. We had three feet of snow in Washington, D.C. in the middle of the event. We had 22 of the 85 people were stranded there for three more days. Keith loves that experience. And then the, we had the assess 2017 Congress where we, um, had two keynote presentations, eight to 10 technology briefings, and 16 working sessions on particular assess related themes with two sessions for each theme. And now we're launching the assess 2018 Congress in Chateau Elan outside of Atlanta. We're targeting 115 people. We've got Mark Mealy from Procter and Gamble giving a presentation, Dimitri Mavris um, from the Aerospace Systems Design Laboratory in Georgia Tech is giving uh, our keynote presentations. We've introduced this new concept we called Notes from the Front, which is actually people telling how they're helping move the revolution forward and their experiences in moving the simulation revolution forward. And we have 11 of those presentations. They are actually inspired by the Mayudic Parataxis here. They are a little bit longer. They're 15 minute presentations total each. Uh, but because we've got, we've got to get, what are they doing with the technical content? But, but it is a rapid fire sort of approach. We have 12 to 14 working sessions and whether or not we do the 14 is whether or not we introduce the digital twin theme. And we're still on the, on the verge of making that decision. Um, I'm focused on those with two specific questions per theme. So it's not just an arbitrary discussion. We're having focused questions on those themes and each session will deal with one particular focus question on how to move that theme forward. So it's a collaborative effort to bring together the right people to help move the industry forward. It's not a dictator, it's not a, a, a here's what we're doing together, here's what's happening. No, it's a, it's a collaborative effort where everyone works together and it's amazing how we can actually get the people from ANSYS and Simulia and uh, ESI and all these different, and Siemens all sitting at the same table talking about the same issues actually trying to, and actually working together to work through them. Um, we've been very successful at that and that was, which was no, Minor feet, I will be honest with you. So I'll leave you with one thought. Viva la simulation revolution.